Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Linux for Noobs. This is the series where you beginners out there get a chance to shine in the spotlight because this content is just for you. This is for those of you out there that have no experience whatsoever with Linux. Maybe you want to know what it is, why you should care about it, and you know what? We have already talked about what Linux is in earlier episodes and why you should care about it, but what we should talk about now is how you can have a successful migration over to Linux because in this video, I am going to give you guys 10 tips for actually having a successful migration over to Linux. And before we get started, I want to mention the sponsor for today's video, which is Linode. Linode has been doing cloud computing since 2003, which is actually before Amazon Web Services was even a thing. On Linode's platform, you can get your server up and running in minutes, and they include all of the popular distributions, such as CentOS, Debian, Ubuntu, Fedora, and get this, also Arch Linux. And let's be honest, what could be better than a Linux cloud server provider that allows you to tell all of your friends, I run Arch? Linode has multiple server plans available to make any app scalable and flexible. You can use it to host a blog, set up a VPN server, a Minecraft server, or you could do what I did and set up a website for your YouTube channel because the official website for Learn Linux TV runs on Linode. And Linode offers 24x7, 365 support, regardless of plan size, so you can get live help from a real person when you need it. New users can get started right now with $100 in credit towards a new account. And I highly recommend you check them out because Linode is awesome. And thank you so much to Linode for your continued sponsorship of Learn Linux TV. They've been a sponsor for quite a while, and I really appreciate it. Now, without any further ado, let's get into my 10 tips on how you can have a successful migration over to Linux. Now, the first tip that I have for you is not the most exciting, but it is a very important one. And that is to document all of the software that you use on a regular basis. Now, the reason why I put this on the list is because whenever I ask someone what applications are important to you for your migration, what are some apps that you really want to see running on Linux or you need to use for some reason, and almost immediately every individual is able to tell me probably three to five things that's important to them right away. But what usually gets people is that other thing that you don't actually use all that often and you didn't really think about, but then when it all comes down to it, oh my gosh, what do I do? I don't have that application now. Um, those are the ones that usually get you. So if you are documenting your application use on a regular basis before you migrate to Linux, maybe give it a few weeks, a few months or so, write down what you use, then you'll be better equipped to understand what types of challenges you may or may not have when you actually do decide to pull the trigger and switch over to Linux. And honestly, that's all there is to it. For the first tip, that's it. Just keep a record of the applications that you use. Just make sure that you're taking everything into account so you are minimizing the chances of running into a surprise or two when you do pull the trigger. And as an extra step for this first tip, if you do some research about alternative applications for those applications that you've written down, then you are one step ahead and I highly recommend that you do that. At least be aware of what's out there. You don't actually have to try anything for this step. It's just a matter of understanding what's available. Now it's time for tip number two. On your current operating system, and I'm gonna put some emphasis on that because again, these are tips for before you switch over to Linux, install some of those alternatives on your current operating system. For example, if you use Microsoft Office, you can install LibreOffice on your computer right now. I don't care if you are running a Mac or if you are running on Windows, you can install LibreOffice on that right now. You don't need to switch to Linux in order to enjoy most of these applications. You can actually start using them right now. And the same holds true for Firefox. If your current browser is Microsoft Edge, maybe you want to consider Firefox as an alternative. But to be fair, Microsoft Edge is available for Linux already, so you could actually stick with that if that is your application of choice when it comes to browsing the web. But the key point here is to install any of the alternative apps that you may want to use on Linux on your current operating system before you switch, because the idea is you can get used to those applications, and then when you do switch over to Linux, you'll already know how to use them, 
because 99.9% of the time, the applications are going to be the same. LibreOffice on Linux is the same as LibreOffice on Windows and on Mac. Yes, there's going to be a few quirks here and there between the different versions, but more often than not, they're going to be exactly the same. So you don't need to switch over to Linux in order to use those apps. You can use those alternative apps right now. You can get used to them, and then you'll be ahead of the game for when the day comes to actually switch over to Linux. Now, tip number three. I probably could have added this earlier in the list. It could have even been the first item, but I'm not actually doing these in any particular order. Number three is to adjust your mindset such that you don't assume compatibility before you actually test compatibility. And this is one of those things that I see a lot in a lot of message boards out there, and I've covered this in a previous episode. I'll see topics such as... Uh, my computer doesn't work now that I've installed Linux. I, I can't get online. I, I can't use wireless or my video card doesn't work. And the thing is, a lot of people may not understand is that most distributions, they offer a live mode in the install media, which means you can test the Linux distribution before you install it. You could test wireless. You could test Ethernet, your GPU, whatever it is you have, your camera, your printer, your scanner. You could test all of that before you install. Don't assume compatibility. And the thing is, a lot of people out there, you know, people like me that love Linux, they want to just, you know, talk about Linux. And I talk about Linux all the time. I have a channel for it after all. But the thing is, they will brag about Linux a lot. They'll say, yeah, it runs on everything. Any computer you have, it'll run on it. And that's just totally not true. There is no such thing as 100% compatibility with any operating system. Now, to be fair, Linux distributions will often work on most hardware. So you could argue that's kind of true. But for all you know, you could have that one computer that doesn't work well. And someone tells you to switch to Linux, it's fine, it works, and you do, and now your printer doesn't work. Now your scanner doesn't work. What do you do? Um, well, if you are testing compatibility and you don't assume compatibility, then you'll understand that, you know, that stuff doesn't work. So you'll be prepared for that. But the idea for tip number three is just to adjust your mindset. Don't assume that everything is going to work. And especially don't buy a brand new printer right now if you're in the market for one, assuming that it's going to work with Linux. You might not. I mean, you might not know if it's going to work or not. You have to know before you buy anything if you haven't bought it yet. Obviously, you might have a printer already. You might have a scanner already. But if you don't have a particular piece of hardware that you plan on buying, at least research the compatibility with Linux before you buy it. And then after you do switch to Linux from that point forward, you should never buy anything that you want to use with your computer unless you have already confirmed that it will work with Linux. Because again, there's no such thing as 100% compatibility. And anyone that tells you Linux works on everything, they're either, you know, extremely happy about Linux, but they're telling you something that's not true. It, there's, again, there's just no 100% compatibility in all of computing. It just doesn't exist. So just take some time and make sure you understand that. Now, tip number four, and this might be a little obvious to some of you, and maybe you'll even roll your eyes as soon as I mention it, but you really should consider a dual boot. Now, to be fair, I don't like dual boots, to be completely honest with you, because I always feel like a computer should have one operating system, that an operating system and a computer is a one-to-one -one relationship. And there's some challenges when it comes to dual booting. Like, for example, you could run a Windows update and it just overwrites the boot sector and now you don't even have an option for booting into Linux anymore. It happens. But um, as much as I don't personally like the concept of dual booting, that's just a personal opinion. It's very effective for new users because you could run side by side your current operating system and a Linux distribution. And if you get to the point, you know, you're using Linux, you're like, you know, I like it, but I need a break. You know, everything is taking so long for me to learn. I need to boot back into Windows, Mac, or whatever it is, and just use my current platform because I, I've, just, I've had it for the day. I need a break. And that's okay because we're human. And, and, you know, there's a learning curve here. Sometimes it could be frustrating. And that's okay. That's how it goes. You have to kind of pace yourself a little bit. Now, obviously, you shouldn't even set up a dual boot until you actually confirm compatibility, which I've already mentioned. But after you've done that, and you know that Linux will work well on your system with your hardware, and you have a backup, which you should always have before you basically set up anything, set up a dual boot, even if it's just in the short term, so you can actually have both side by side. For tip number five, it's very similar to the previous one. It's all about running your current platform and your chosen Linux distribution, if you do have a chosen Linux distribution, side by side, because you can always return to the old one, the old platform, 
if you need a break. But maybe you don't want to do a dual boot. Maybe you agree with me. Maybe you would prefer not to do that. Or maybe you would just prefer not to risk your current computer, install Linux, and mess something up. That's okay. Now, another alternative to the previous tip, that's where tip 5 comes in, is you could choose to buy a secondhand laptop and install Linux on that. The thing is, business class laptops are really, really good, but they're also very expensive. I mean, you could spend 1300 US dollars pretty easily on one of these or even more than that. But I'm not saying that you should spend that much money because those business class laptops, as they age and the price depreciates, you could get one for two or 300 US dollars, sometimes even less than that. And the thing is, they're often very good today. I actually reviewed a couple of them on my channel, a couple of old laptops that you could buy today that are still good for Linux. I'll put a card for one of them right about here. So that's one of the videos that I did about this subject, and I'll put another one right about here. So you could check out either one of those two videos for two models that you could consider buying, a Dell Latitude and a ThinkPad, for example, which are always good models. Again, research to be sure, but if you have some extra money and you don't mind buying a secondhand laptop, then you don't even have to wipe or format your main computer. You could just run Linux off of one of those and just have a dedicated device. And then when you feel like, yeah, I get it. I understand this Linux distribution that I've chose. I know how to use it. All my apps work on that. And I've already copied my data over as a test, for example. I think it's time to format my main rig and install Linux on that. Well, now you can because you've had a chance to check it out on a dedicated machine. And if you can do that, then I recommend you do that, especially if you have a laptop lying around. Maybe you bought a new computer and you didn't get rid of your old one. Well, you know what? You should probably consider putting that old computer to use because it might just give you the opportunity you need to test out Linux. Now for number six on my list, we need to talk about gaming. It's the Linux elephant in the room, the thing that people, you know, bring up constantly when you bring up Linux, but it doesn't play my games. And I know not all of you play games, so not all of you care about this. But for those of you that do care about this, you're very passionate about this, because if you play Windows games on Steam, you probably want those to work. Now, for me personally, this is one problem I don't have, because it just so happens that all the games that I want to play run on Linux. I'm just a weird edge case. Well, I'm often a weird edge case anyway, but I guess I'm just lucky. The games that I want to play, they they all run on Linux. I don't even have a problem. Now, there is one that doesn't. It's Skyrim. I love that game. They don't have a Linux version at all, but thankfully, it's pretty easy to get to work on Linux, though, so I don't really count that. But there's going to be many of you out there that want to play a game, and there is no Linux version, or you just can't make it work with Linux, and I get it. And some people get upset when it comes to Linux about this, but I don't really understand that. I mean, even as a kid, and I'm going to use video games as an example again, I had a Sega Genesis. Later, I you know bought a Super Nintendo, but when I had a Sega Genesis, I understood that Sega Genesis cartridges are, are what works in a Sega Genesis. I wasn't upset that my Sega didn't run Super Mario World, for example, because when I made the decision to buy the Sega Genesis, I knew I was making a decision for that platform. And that's just the way it goes. But for some reason, people get upset when um, they say, you know, about Linux, it doesn't run my Windows games. I hate it. Well, it's not advertised to run your Windows games. Linux runs Linux software. Windows runs Windows software. That's just the way it is. That's the way computing is. There's no guarantee or promise or even any expectation whatsoever that an operating system should run something it wasn't meant to run. But the fact of the matter is, regardless of that, you have games you want to play. You want to play those games. And you don't care about the politics. You don't care if it's supposed to work or not. You just want to play your games, and that's how it goes. I get it. Now, one thing you could consider doing, you could do a dual boot, like I mentioned earlier, but that was a previous tip. You could consider actually using a secondary computer for Linux, and turn your Windows computer into a gaming console. I mean, just think about it. If your computer already runs Windows, and if you're buying a new computer anyway, that could be your Linux computer. And then your Windows computer, you could turn it into a gaming console by having Steam Auto Start in big picture mode. Hook it up to your TV. See if you could source a Steam controller or an Xbox controller. And you could effectively turn it into a Windows gaming console that's dedicated for that purpose. Now it doesn't matter because you have a dedicated machine for that. Now, another thing you could do is set up a headless Windows server. Now, I don't mean Windows server like actually download Windows server, but take your current machine 
and just make it a headless streaming server, have it run Steam, and you could actually use Steam streaming on your Linux machines, even if they don't have a GPU, to play your Windows games. And if your network is fast enough, it doesn't matter anymore. You could run your Windows games on Linux because they're running from a Windows machine on your network, and then you could play them on your Linux computer. Now, the thing that's kind of hard about this is that when it comes to a headless Windows gaming server, you could argue that's hard to achieve because games require a monitor. And when a monitor is absent, they won't run because that's just how the code of these games, that's how it was developed. It, it's expecting a surface to draw onto, a 1080p surface, for example. I don't know what they're called, though, but you can buy these and they do exist. I call them fake monitors. All they are are HDMI plugs that look like flash drives. You plug them into an HDMI slot and it has monitor information on there. And when the computer sees that, that device says, I am a 1080p monitor. Honest. I, I swear. Yeah, that's what I am. Yeah, for real. And then your computer's like, oh, cool. I have a monitor attached, even though it doesn't. It's just this stupid looking dongle that looks like a flash drive. But that's all that's required to make Steam able to be run headless. And then you can have your Windows gaming server streaming Windows games to your Linux computers, even computers that are not all that great when it comes to performance. Maybe they have a weak CPU, as long as the network card is good, the Wi-Fi card. I mean, you kind of want to be on wired Ethernet if you can, but I get it. Everyone's using wireless now. You basically want some good bandwidth. If your computer can do that, your Linux computer, then you could run those Windows games that way, and that might just solve your problem. Now, item number seven is somewhat important because it's all about choosing the right distro. And we've covered this um, earlier in the series, but it is something to consider, right? Because you want to choose a distribution that's going to work for you and you should choose it along with who can support you. That's the main takeaway for number seven. You are obviously new, otherwise you probably wouldn't be watching this series and you want to run Linux, but you want to run something that's not archaic. You don't want to run that distribution that's number 75 on DistroWatch, whatever that happens to be. You want to run something that is well known and works fairly well. But you want to make sure that you choose a distribution that's at least somewhat popular. If nothing else, if there's someone in your circle of friends that knows a particular distribution fairly well, you might want to choose that one because if you choose a distribution that is outside what anyone in your circle knows, assuming anyone in your circle does know about Linux, then you are handicapping yourself, basically. You want to make sure that you choose something that's well supported and something that you can get help on. And another thing that you might want to consider is the community. Some distributions just have angry community members. It's horrible. Um, I don't know if the Arch community is still like that now, but I know at least was. Um, it was bad at one point. And the thing is, you don't want to choose a distribution that has a very grumpy community because then you're just going to get, you know, you, you might rage quit that distro. Now, if nothing else, you could choose the community for this YouTube channel. We have our own forums, community.learnlinux.tv. And if you go on there, we'll help you out. If you have some questions, we'll try to answer those questions for you. And if you have someone in that community, in my community, that is yelling at you, flaming you, or just being rude, I will yell at them personally because I don't, we don't do that. That's just not how it works. The forums for this channel, we are inclusive. We understand that you may not be an expert. So come on over to the community forums for this channel and you could post some questions there. Now, of course, we hope that you have done your research first before you post a topic. We still won't yell at you for that. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, just to be fair, it's usually a good idea to, you know, do your research if you can. But even if you can't, Give us as much detail as you possibly can about the challenge that you are facing and we'll try to help you out. Now, number eight is really important to me and it's all about understanding the learning curve. Now, something that really annoys me is people paint Linux as something that's hard to use. And that might be because it really was hard to use. When I first started using it, oh my gosh, it was tough. I would often brick my computer just by trying to install the NVIDIA driver, for example. It's not like that anymore. It's not hard to use anymore, but that reputation just didn't really seem to leave. I mean, people still think you need to use the command line for everything, and you really don't. 
I use the command line for everything just because I like it. I think it's cool. I love doing that. And I manage a lot of servers, so it comes naturally to me. But you don't have to use the command line. But you do have to understand that there is a learning curve. Now, when people say Linux is hard to use, you shouldn't use it. No, that's just not true. And they imply that Windows is easy to use and Mac OS is easy to use. And that's totally not true. Now, before you flame me in the comments, I'll give you an example. I had an individual when I was a young adult that wanted a computer. I gave her a computer and I put Linux on it. And that was the first computer that she owned, actually. And you know what? She learned Linux. I can't remember what distro it was on there at that time, but she learned it. She knew it. And that was her first experience. So when a friend of hers asked her to help her with a Windows computer issue, she got extremely frustrated. She called me up. She's like, how can anyone use Windows? This is the hardest operating system to learn. I put a flash drive in. I think it was actually an MP3 player that's kind of like a flash drive. And I don't see it. I can't figure out how to access this flash drive. I'm like, did you check my computer? And she's like, what? Should there be an icon on the desktop? On my computer, I put in a flash drive or an MP3 player. There's an icon on the desktop. I double click on it. Super easy. Why isn't that the case here? Uh, it's Windows. It's different. What do you mean it's different? Go to my computer. Oh, there it is. Then I have to walk her through this and she gets very heated because she hates the way Windows works and she doesn't find it to be a very usable interface. But other people think it's extremely easy to use and they only think it's easy to use because they started with that or they had some time to adapt to it. Nobody is born out of the womb understanding how to use any operating system, period, end of discussion. So I don't like to hear that, you know, operate, you know, a certain operating system is hard to use. Now, granted, if you are trying to install Arch, okay, fine. There's going to be some distributions that are harder to use than others, but when it all comes down to it, what you find difficult depends on your worldview. If you started with Mac, then everything else is going to be hard. I didn't even start using Mac until maybe three or four years, years ago when I started using it for the first time. And I was like really annoyed with it. I did learn it. It didn't take me too long, but I just got frustrated and I didn't know where things were. It was a learning curve for me, just like it would be for anyone else. So understand that if you have a frustrating time with Linux, it's not because Linux is hard. It's just because it's not what you're used to. Just hang in there and you'll get the hang of it. Now for number nine. And I guess you could argue it's somewhat similar to the previous one. But if you try a distribution and you hate it, don't give up on Linux. I had someone early in my career come to me and they said, I hate Linux. I gave it a shot. I, I tried it and tried it and tried it and tried it. And I just couldn't make it work for me. I hate the interface. I hate everything about it. It's horrible. I'm never using it again. And then I asked that individual, well, what distribution did you use? I'm not answering that. It doesn't even matter. It's Linux. I don't care. I don't want to use it anymore. The fact is, when I got some more information from that person, what I learned is that she tried the first distribution she could, and that was it. She hated it, and she moved on. That was it. She was done, and she just rage quit the entire thing. The fact of the matter is, you could have a friend that recommends something to you. Hey, try Ubuntu. It's great. And you could hate it. Uh, someone could say, try uh, KDE Neon, and you hate it. Maybe you're not going to like it, but that's why we have different distributions, right? Because we have different styles of use cases and different individual styles that we ourselves prefer. And we could find a distribution that works for us. So if the first distribution, second, third, fourth, fifth, if that's not working for you, just keep trying because somebody somewhere has created a distribution that is more catered to your style. And I think you'll find it. You might not like the first thing that you use. Just hang in there and don't give up. Now for number 10, and I'm actually noticing how I should have ordered these better, but I guess I can't go back and redo this video. Well, I could, but I'm not. Number 10 is about creating a support circle if you don't already have one. So I mentioned earlier, if there's someone in your circle that's good at a particular distribution and they offer to help you, then you probably should choose that distribution. If you um, join a Linux community and, you know, the community seems helpful, maybe you should go that direction. You choose a distribution that you have the most support on. But what if you don't have any support at all? You have no friends that know Linux. Um, maybe your friends, they don't even know what the heck you're talking about. Linux? Like, what is he talking about? Um, they don't know. That's okay. You could choose to look for a community or join a community before you switch to Linux. Just check a few of them out. If nothing else, join mine. Again, community.learnlinux.tv. Create your support circle before you switch. So if something goes wrong, you have something that you can do. You can actually ask questions. And make sure you pay it forward, though. This is important. Because if you ask questions constantly 
and you're not, you know, partaking in the discussions. Otherwise, people might think, well, that person's just asking questions. They're not really doing anything for us. Um, and there's no rules in my forums, for example, that you have to give back. But I recommend that you do because at some point you're going to learn and you're going to know it well. And when that day comes, maybe you can help somebody out and you can let them know what they can do to fix a problem. And you could pay it forward and join that community as more of an advisor and help people out once you get to that point. But in the meantime, try to create a circle. And if there's a computer club near you, join it. If it's a if it's an in-person thing, and I know in-person is harder nowadays than it was, but that aside, if you could find a Linux club or a computer club near you, join it because you might be able to get a circle together and you could help each other get through any of the hurdles that you encounter while you switch to Linux. So there you go. Those are my 10 tips that'll hopefully help you have a more successful migration over to Linux, and I really hope it helps you out. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. I look forward to hearing what you guys have to say. And click that like button if you did like this video. It lets YouTube know that you want to see more content just like this. And if the video helped you, please share it. Word of mouth really helps. Just share this video with your friends. Maybe you can get them on Linux too the right way with these tips. And that'll definitely help me out because it spreads the content, it spreads the learning, and it's all good. So thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you again in the next video. Thanks for watching.